And the reviews from last week's episode are in. Juan says, please keep on making these videos. They're fucking great. Anonymous reviewers say, my new favorite X-File. And great work, Anon. I hope there will be more. The New York Times calls it an affront to criticism and review. The creator should be put on trial, drawn, and co This isn't what I wrote down. Can I have your opinion on this? Oh, cool. Someone wants to have my opinion on something. What is this? Oh, no! Episode 2, Clockwork. Clockwork Your Time Is Up is something I can barely qualify as a creepypasta. It's just so fucking stupid in every aspect that it's almost impossible to think of that the writer was completely serious when they wrote it. That is not some kind of bad joke. But with all of the other terrible pastas you see on the deletion log refugee page of the troll pasta wiki, you understand that Clockwork really is being completely serious. The story isn't exactly popular, certainly not at the level of something like Jeff the Killer or Squidward Suicide. In fact, it's almost universally hated, and I'm in the group that and doesn't like it. I don't like this story, not one bit. If you've seen my Jeff the Killer video, you know that I brought it up in that, among other pastas grouped together in a genre that I call villainous character promoting slasher fanfiction. But Clockwork stands out in its shittiness above even something like Laughing Jack or Jane the Killer, and in some aspects, even, you know, Jeff the Killer, the one that started it all. Which is... so sad. A lot of the issues I have with Clockwork story-wise, character-wise, they can all be summed up in my Jeff the Killer video. It's... They're, they're almost identical stories, honestly. In terms of the fact that, you know, it's a story told from the serial killer's perspective. The serial killer is too sympathetic. Except Clockwork desperately, desperately tries to up the ante on that. So we're gonna take a look at it. Number one, time is not on your side. Clockwork desperately tries to work in a theme of time not being on our main character's side. However, this feels unbelievably forced. There's no connection or significance in the events that frustrate our main character. It's almost like the author just thought of the your time is up catchphrase and tried to work it on that theme based on that alone. Imagine a universe where Jeff the Killer actually puts people to sleep because of his catchphrase, you know? And not just because the new story is so fucking long and boring that it puts you to sleep, but the fact that he does that still has nothing to do with his character or motivations. On the topic of time and long and boring stories, Clockwork falls into the category of creepypastas, much like Jeff the Killer 2015, that have no problem with the fact that they waste your time with pointless nonsense. Again, much like Jeff the Killer, a lot of time in the story is spent focused on our main character, Natalie. And if that's not also the author's name, I'm gonna eat my Smokey the Bear hat. As I just said, Clockwork has these same problems with the justified serial killer, whose story we're being told from their perspective, but it does up the ante in one really big way that's just quite frankly disgusting. Number two. <laughs> Clockwork is a story that uses the act of childhood incestuous rape and physical and mental abuse as a means of making the main character more sympathetic and justified in their murderings. Natalie is flat out raped by her older brother as a very young child. The act is thankfully not written out in detail, but you know what happened. It explains that it happened later. Let me be clear when I say that including rape in your story, especially the rape of a child by their family, something that is surprisingly common and something I'm not particularly comfortable talking about out loud right now, which makes me very glad that I'm home alone while I'm recording this, is something that you should not attempt in your story if you're not going to be able to handle it maturely. And boy does clockwork fucking fail at that. Not only is the subject of rape handled poorly from a storytelling perspective, it's also handled poorly from a horror perspective. Rape is fucking scary on its own, but that's probably the biggest problem with it. Much like the graphically murdered children in Squidward's suicide, it feels like a cheap shot. The creepypasta equivalent of a jump scare. And just because reading about rape or dismembered children makes you feel queasy or uncomfortable, it doesn't mean that the writing is good. The author's not 
scared you. They've taken the advantage of the fact that you're a normal person who reacts to these things accordingly. You can count down the seconds to a predictable jump scare in a modern horror movie and still wind up jumping in your seat a bit, and you still read about a touchy, uncomfortable subject in something as poorly written as clockwork and still feel like you need to take a shower afterwards. It's just a natural reaction. Number 3. The Characters Unlike Jeff, Natalie is seen from the very start as a child who casually enjoys drawing blood and gore, something that appropriately scares her parents and teachers and friends. This is still a problem because by this point we've established that Natalie has been beaten by her father since a very young age, so we understand her intentions and she is, much like Jeff the Killer, not mysterious in the slightest. The story also falls into the same pitfall as Jeff of telling the story with a window into the serial killer's mind. I'm gonna get into some writing 101 here. You typically want to tell the story from the perspective of a regular schlub who isn't too familiar with all the weird goings on of the story world. That way when something is explained to this character, it's explained to us in an organic way and things about other characters we aren't following are revealed at a natural pace. In a better written story, this would be told from the perspective of a friend or relative, someone who's slowly learning more about Natalie and is becoming more and more terrified the more they discover. Anyways, aside from her psychosis, Natalie is completely ordinary up until the point where she's taken to a mental hospital. When she isn't drawing gore or saying cryptic things for the sake of trying to make her character seem scary, she acts like a normal girl and reacts to things accordingly. It's everyone else that's the problem. Again, like Jeff, the characters are just too cruel. Her father beats her, her brother rapes her, the girls at school start to bully her for getting raped, her mother just doesn't even give a shit, and neither do the teachers. And the doctors are crazy scientist cliches. I don't have to go through what I said about Randy and 2015 Jeff's parents again, do I? Number 4, The Writing The writing in this story would be laughable if the story was any fun at all. I already mentioned the forced theme of time, but there's more bizarre quirks that are just fucking incomprehensible. Like for instance, the story constantly refers to our main character as the girl known as Natalie. It's just, you know, fucking Natalie. It only does that so at the end she can gain her new persona of clockwork, stealing the name of arguably the coolest Sly Cooper villain. The story also has no sense of pacing. Within a few paragraphs, the girl known as Natalie jumps from being a small child with a stuffed giraffe who still colors on the walls to a nine-year-old to a 16 year old, and that's where we spend the rest of our story. Typically with a creepypasta, you want to keep your story in either a short chronological time frame, or just make the story short. Some of the best creepypastas out there are actually the shortest. Like for instance, a young girl is playing in her bedroom when she hears her mother call to her from the kitchen. So she runs downstairs to meet her mother. As she's running through the hallway, the door to the cupboard under the stairs opens, and Hand reaches out and pulls her in. It's her mother. She whispers to her child, Don't go into the kitchen. I heard it too. Or, So you're with your honey, and you're making out. When the phone rings, you answer it, and the voice is, What are you doing with my daughter? You tell the girl, and she say, My dad is dead. THEN WHO WAS FOUL? Brevity is the soul of wit, especially with creepypastas or horror in general. Short horror stories are a favorite of mine. It's why I tend to like creepypastas, short horror videos on YouTube, and anthology movies like VHS. However, as noted before, Clockwork doesn't give a shit about how much of your time it's wasting. It spends all of its time following the same plot beats as Jeff the Killer, just upping the cruelty something that was already disproportionately unrealistic in Jeff the Killer. And again, there's no deeper underlying horror. It's just a murderous revenge fantasy. So everything leading up to it is completely pointless. Unless you think justifying your killer is a good idea. Number 5, what can laughingly be called the story. Clockwork starts off with a terrified young girl being brutally beaten by her father for coloring on the walls and scene. Moving on years later, we get to the point where her brother awkwardly asks to rape her and scene. We then cut to the point where she's a 16 year old girl going about her regular high school life. She's still scared of her cunt dad and has flashbacks of what we can infer are potentially hundreds of other traumatic experiences that have transpired in the seven years we haven't been following. Upon going to school the next day, we are given information that her mom seems annoyed with her for pretty much no reason. She's being a bitch so that we can feel bad for Natalie some more, 
when the story has already blown its load by having her character be sexually assaulted over a period of four years. Compared to that, a snippy mom and a douchebag teacher don't exactly hold much water. You might think I'm harping on the whole rape thing, but the story hammers the point in a lot harder than I am. It's not like it happens and it's just dropped immediately. It's at this point that we get a hint that the author may not be a native English speaker, explaining the terrible use of the English language. Both Natalie and the teacher's last names are very European sounding, I guess, and we're not given a clear setting, so it comes off as distracting and confusing. It's also here that we get the first bit of the forced time theme, but it's delivered in such a mundane way. Natalie is late turning in her homework, and the teacher tells her that her time is up to turn it in. That's the first thing we get, right? That's when she starts getting this feeling like, oh man, time is just not on my side, is it? The next time it happens, it's not even a paragraph later. The other teacher just tells her the same thing about her French classwork. With those two instances, the story then tells us that time always seemed to be against Natalie. Like, are you fucking serious? Everyone who isn't an intellectual tear away from telepathy has had late work, alright? And the fact that these events occur immediately after one another? The second one, she's just doodling in her notebook. It just leads me to believe that time is on her side. She's just being lazy. Number six, more retarded ass self-dismemberment bullshit. So apparently this lazy, delinquent weirdo who never turns in her homework stays up all night in the computer and probably passed P.E. with a D- minus like me has a fucking boyfriend. But he comes to the shocking realization that he should probably not be sticking his dick in crazy and breaks up with her. He probably just got finished masturbating in the school bathroom and came to this realization after that clearness of mind you get. Don't you hate it when that happens? So she gets pissed off and, like a crazy person, stitches a smile onto her mouth. The self-mutilation of the mouth is so ripped off from Jeff the Killer it almost makes this story funny. This author is expressing absolutely zero creativity and is borrowing from a story that already felt ripped off from the Joker. But you'd have to stitch a smile on your face to even pretend to enjoy any of the retarded bullshit to come. So the girl known as Natalie's mom comes in and sees her daughter going way too far for her femme joker cosplay and sends her off to get some much needed therapy. Why this wasn't done before when she was being beaten and raped as a child, I don't know. I don't fucking care anymore! So Natalie bitches to the therapist that time is her problem. Here's the quote from the story explaining her thought process. Time. Time has been my problem. Deborah gave her a confused look. What about time, dear? Natalie's hands roughly gripped the leather of the seat. Everything. It makes you live through it. Slowly progressing through life. Being controlled by society, what the fuck? Only to be tortured. For seemingly to no end. Until you find you no longer have a purpose. It's a vicious circle. Time does not end. It does not slow down. It does not speed up. It is violent. It makes you live through the torture over and over again, unable to fast forward away from it. All because this dumb bitch was doodling in class instead of doing her fucking work. You don't get time altering stand powers or an Adam Sandler universe altering remote control just so you can have more time to dick around and draw shitty Jeff the Killer fan art in class. So the girl known as Natalie keeps talking like a crazy person, eventually saying that Natalie's not there anymore. So this therapist understandably freaks out and gets out of the room to get some help for this schizophrenic weirdo. The author attempts some Lemony Snicket style of writing here. It doesn't fit in with the tone of the writing style of the rest the story at all, like listen to this. She walked out, leaving Natalie alone. Maybe if she had done something at this point, she wouldn't have come to be what she is today. Maybe more people would be alive, and maybe she would be sane again. As much as I would love to, I would admit that she got up from that chair and stopped this all from happening. But I'm obligated to give you the horrid truth. Natalie did not move. She sat perfectly still, perfectly silent, and perfectly calm in that chair. If this was the style of writing consistent with the rest of the story, I'd write it off as an homage to the style in a series of unfortunate events. But I can't do that, so it just seems distracting and weird. At least she didn't put a page full of, like, Evers, or just three pages full of black. Anyway, her parents show up, and upon being told that their daughter is a crazy person, no doubt due to years of neglect and physical and psychological abuse, they dump her off at some crazy house mental hospital and she wakes up strapped to a bed. Just like in my erotic fanfiction. Number seven, does that make me? 
Crazy. So a doctor, described in the story as literally looking like a cliche scientist, comes in and says they're going to be putting Natalie on mental drugs. That is a quote from the story. That's how they describe it. They knock her out with sleeping gas, but she wakes up in the middle of her surgery and is totally aware of what's happening. This is actually something some patients of surgery go through, and it's a legitimately scary prospect, so I'll give the story that much. However, it completely ruins it by having this be some kind of moment of awakening of her superhuman powers. She manages to break free of all her bindings, rips off the masks and IV tubes, and starts laughing like a generic crazy yandere anime girl. Also like some kind of cartoon, once this happens, her eyes turn totally green. So if you were playing Mary Sue Bingo while watching this, you can go ahead and cross off unique eye color. It's even explained that they glow in the dark later in the story. She then brutally butchers the doctor in a way that at least has graphic depictions of the murders up on Jeff the killer, but it goes way too far. It's just so tryhard and edgy and pointless. Then the most retarded thing ever happens. Guards come in and pull guns on her after seeing the horribly dismembered doctor, but using the power of her stand, time keeps on slipping, Natalie manages to dodge the bullets in the slow down time and kills all of them too. Number 8. <laughs> so even though Natalie has no idea where she was, she manages to get back to her house on what we can assume is the same night. Because ironically for a story with a central theme about time, the passage of time seems to have no effect on the story. So Natalie busts down the door on her mother with two knives in hand. She uses her stand to slow down time and throws the knives at her mother. When time resumes as normal, she's hurled into a hook hanging on the wall, which gruesomely impales her in the back of the head. Natalie then cuts out her mother's still beating heart and shoves it in her mouth as she dies. Natalie's reason for murdering her is that she did nothing while Natalie was suffering, but this is such a brutal murder, it feels not only like overkill, but also like the author is going to have to up the ante to a major level in order to top it. However, unlike managing to top the sexual assault earlier, the author actually manages to make the following deaths even more cartoonishly and senselessly graphic. So she gets to the dad and they have a big, dumb, retarded fight, and yet, for as much as the dad is putting up a fight, there's absolutely no tension because it's established at this point that Natalie is such an overpowered Mary Sue that there's no possible way she can lose. After a wave of terrible action movie one-liners, Natalie finally manages to kill her dad by basically using a pole from the bed as a rolling pin on his body. We can ignore any leaps made out of the laws of physics by this point because we just don't fucking care! Anyway, it's finally time for her to murder her rapist brother. He puts up a fight and claims that their mother always liked her best. Probably because she wasn't the pedophile rapist, but maybe I'm just jumping to conclusion. He starts to beat her in the face with a baseball bat, but she blocks the last hit with her knives after slowing down time and flings him all the way to his bed. She then proceeds to eviscerate her brother, cutting out his intestines, brutally ripping off his toes and fingers, and sticking one of those fingers into the back of his throat, choking him. It's all a senseless, emotionless gore fest. It's not fun at all. I'm not having fun anymore. Number 9, do you even fucking care anymore? So she finishes up ripping apart her brother after saying her stupid ass catchphrase for the hundredth time and looks at herself in the bathroom mirror. She hears a pocket watch and dismantles it so only the clock face remains. In another moment, almost ripped directly from Jeff the Killer, she removes her eye and places the watch face in its socket. She then declares that she is clockwork and vanishes into the night after burning down her house. The story then tries to convince you that she might still be out there, waiting to murder you like a ghost in a spam letter your grandmother emails you. With this, the story finally comes to a conclusion, and the reader is left completely exhausted. I know I'm completely exhausted. And the boring and pointless bullshit that precedes the senseless, Saw movie tier slaughter is completely disorienting. But the biggest problem here isn't the fact that what you just read was graphic and uncomfortable for the wrong reasons. The biggest problem here is that you just read Jeff the Killer again, except longer and with a girl who has a stand. I don't even think the author tried to make an original character, and they just slapped everything wrong with Jeff the Killer onto a 16 year old version of themselves and raped and beat her for sympathy points. You don't need me to tell you that this story is irredeemable. I wouldn't even try to fix it. But you might be wondering if it's worth reading for a good laugh at how shit the writing is. Honestly, 
Not really. The writing in English is awful, in a pretty funny way, honestly, but the story is just too horrible and painful and uncomfortable to sit through, and there's so much of it. If you're gonna ingest this story in any way, go watch the bad creepypasta reading of it. It covers a lot of the same bases as I did, in terms of why this story doesn't work and cuts out all the disgusting violence. I'll see you all next time when I hopefully cover something I'll have a lot more fun discussing. As always, feel free to leave your suggestions in the comments. Maybe something good this time, huh? Maybe something that doesn't make me want to gouge out my own eyes. I'd love to stick around and keep talking about what a piece of shit this story is, but my time is up. I'll see you all next time.